if you wouldn't mind, give us, and by us, I mean Catholics and non-Catholics alike. I'm not Catholic, um, but I'm interested. I'm not Catholic, but interested. That's what Tucker Carlson said recently in his interview with Cardinal Mueller. And as these things go, this has been reported as Carlson being interested in becoming a Catholic. We're going to discuss all that and more on this episode of The John Hunter Weston Show. Stay tuned. Let's begin, as we always do, with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Unfortunately, he wasn't saying, I'm not a Catholic, but I'm interested in becoming a Catholic. Uh, he was saying he was interested as an external observer in the direction of the Catholic Church in our day, and as well as Francis is leaning towards progressive politics. But this has prompted me to send a personal message to Tucker and to explain why becoming a Catholic would be the fulfillment of everything that he has indeed been saying. Tucker, it's great that you say you're interested in where the Catholic Church is going. Even naturally speaking, the Church is a significant institution in the world today. But I'm here to say that there are no external observers to the Church of Christ. The Church doesn't want observers or even admirers. She wants sons, whom the Church can raise into warriors for Christ. As Christ said, he that is not with me is against me. Sooner or later, each one of us realizes that we must make a definitive choice. Are we with him or against him? So, who is against Christ? You already know who is against Christ, of course. In 2023, you made the following comments on the insidious eternal forces that lie behind the global push to normalize abortion. Let's take a listen. Outside forces are acting on people at all times throughout history in every culture on the planet to convince people that if they sacrifice their children, they will be happy and safe. And that's exactly what this is. This is a religious right. Now they're saying abortion is itself a pathway to joy. Really? So this is not a political debate. This is a spiritual battle. Yes. There is no other conclusion. Now, Tucker, you didn't say who it was that you thought was behind this global push for abortion, but it's clear what you were implying in that it was a steady, unwavering, demonic influence across all time and all continents. In fact, just a few months ago, you mentioned that you, quote, believe in aliens in the sense that you think that there are spiritual beings. Let's listen again to what you said. It's my personal belief, based on a fair amount of evidence, that they're not aliens. They've always been here. Um, and, I, and I do think it's spiritual. That's, that's my view. So, and, and again, it's not provable, but based on, uh, on the evidence, I think. And later on, you said this. Let's take a look. But one thing I know for a dead certain fact, having seen it, is that um, there is good and evil that we are being acted upon at all times. And I think every person can feel that in himself. I mean, there are moments when you are moved to do things that are much better than you actually are, and that are also more evil and destructive than you actually are. You are subject to forces from outside yourself. That is absolutely true. Now, we can argue about what they are. There are forces that are not human, that do exist in a spiritual realm of some kind, that we cannot see, a lot of people mocked you for saying this, but we didn't. Your belief in spiritual forces, perhaps posing as something else, chimes in precisely with the Catholic faith. Russell Brand told you that we've all been on to something for years, and you agreed with what he was saying. Let's take a look at that again. The reason I mentioned at the beginning of this rather caroming answer figures that are broadly condemned as conspiracy theorists, but then aren't we all these days? Is the reason I mentioned them is because they talk specifically about ideas to do with spirituality, morality, and ethics. And it's hard for someone like me to consider that the goals of this global establishment are anything other than power, finance, dominion. But when you talk about this loathing of nature, whether that's human nature or botany, or the great expense. Yes. It's difficult yes. to think that there isn't something dark yes! <laughs> at its core. 
because there's no rational explanation for that. How could you want to despoil nature? How could you hate human nature? How could you want to hurt people? There, those are not rational responses to anything. I mean, there's got to be, I mean, clearly what we're watching are the fruits of spiritual war. I, if you can think of a better explanation, let me know. Certainly the solution seems to me to be spiritual. We couldn't have put it better. Clearly what we're watching are the fruits of a spiritual war. You can think, if you can think of a better explanation, let me know. And as Brand said after, certainly the solution seems to me to be spiritual. Tucker, about these spiritual forces, which you have recognized act upon us for evil, we Catholics know what they are. We know how they act and why. We know what they fear and we know how to fight them. They are devils, Tucker. Fallen angels. They are terrible ancient spirits whose intelligence and power far outstrips anything we could imagine. Like you said, what they do seems irrational because it is guided by an overarching hatred. Hatred of God. Hatred of us. The creatures whom he has redeemed. And hatred for the divine plan ordering our world toward this redemption and return to God. That hatred, that hatred too is more powerful than anything else we could imagine. This isn't some superstitious idea of monsters and goblins. Even the best natural philosophers have realized that spiritual or purely intellectual beings are logically possible and in fact do exist and act in the world. Isn't it funny people say that we make up the idea of demons to frighten children and yet the agents of these forces now try to frighten us into disbelief in demons for fear of being thought childish? What do these devils fear? They fear the cross of Christ, his holy sacraments, and all that is holy. They fear she who is most holy, Mary, the Blessed Virgin, Mother of Christ, the most humble of all creatures. They fear Saint Michael the Archangel. They are venerated and loved in the Roman Catholic Church. And the devils fear the priests and exorcists of the Catholic Church who have told us these things so many times. I could even tell you, another time perhaps, about the victories that the saints and holy men have won over devils in visible form. Saints like St. Anthony, St. Justina, St. Cyprian, a former servant of the devil, by the way, or more modern saints like St. John Vianney, or St. Gemma Golgani, or St. Padre Pio, or Padre Pio for now. So you suggested in one of these talks that the best way to respond to this demonic threat to the world is to emulate the courage of St. Paul the Apostle. Let's see what you said again. But the two qualities that really jump out of the story of Paul's life, first and most obviously is the courage. This is like the bravest guy ever. There's not a letter he wrote where he didn't have a sword hanging over his neck. He expected at any moment he murdered, and I think the consensus among historians is, in the end, he was. He was murdered, as were all of his friends. But he lived with the certainty that he was going to be killed for his beliefs every day. And he was totally unbothered by it, completely. He was just moving as fast as he could in the time allotted. He didn't know how much he had, but he just kept going, but he was never afraid. With all due respect, courage is not enough. We need instead to think about why St. Paul was unafraid. What do you think gave him that courage? It's not just because he believed or because he realized that there is obvious superhuman evil in the world and set himself against it. In whatever form the assault on our world comes, none of us can stand against the devils unless we stand in Christ, unless united to him as members of his body. St. Paul was unafraid because he knew that he had upon him the armor of Christ. Look, the devils are more intelligent than the whole of humanity put together. They're stronger than all the armies or all the weaponry we can ever muster. St. Paul himself says, our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spirits and of wickedness in the high places. Therefore, he says, 
take unto you the armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day and to stand in all things perfect. It's because St. Paul knew that he stood in the church, what he called the pillar and bulwark of truth, the one church of which he said, and I quote, one body and one spirit, as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, he said in Ephesians 4. So, one, one, one. He tells us that there is one body which has one faith, and that one body is the Roman Catholic Church. If his body is one, then it is not a collection of disagreeing bodies who, as he says just a few verses down, are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Nope. The early church father, St. Cyprian, followed St. Paul in writing of the church as the spouse of Christ. Here's what he said, and I quote, The spouse of Christ cannot be adulterous. She is uncorrupted and pure. She knows one home. She guards with chaste modesty the sanctity of one bed. She keeps us for God. She appoints the sons whom she has borne for the kingdom. Whoever is separated from the church and is joined to an adulteress is separated from the promises of the church, nor can he who forsakes the church of Christ attain to the rewards of Christ. He is a stranger. He, he is profane. He is an enemy. He can no longer have God. God for his father, who has not the church for his mother. He continued, If anyone could escape who was outside of the ark of Noah, then he also may escape who shall be outside the church. End quote. So, it is from this one body, the Roman Catholic Church, that all other Christian groups have departed. And they remain unable to fully stand in the evil day until they return to the unity, the oneness of the Catholic Church. I know these words sound harsh, but this isn't about triumphalism. It's about saying, come in, come home. Join us in the one place that will prepare you for the battle that you're saying you want to fight. I said to you before, the church does not want observers or even admirers. She wants sons whom she can raise into warriors for Christ. That includes the ladies too, by the way. Regardless of our sex, we are called to share in the sonship of Christ as members of his body. God has one son and one son only, Jesus Christ. If we are to be sons and daughters of God, it is in and through Christ's sonship. So yes, but the word members has another meaning, by the way, that of parts of one body, limbs, so and so on. We all know that before his conversion, St. Paul, or Saul, as his, he was then known, was a deadly persecutor of Christians. He oversaw the first Christian martyrdom, and as the Bible tells us, quote, Saul made havoc of the church, entering in from house to house and dragging away men, women, and committed them to prison, end quote. But just as he could do to any of the globalist leaders advancing the demonic agenda today, Christ knocked him from his horse and blinded him and rebuked him, saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, Saul didn't know what he was talking about, and so he asked, Who are you, Lord? And the answer came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Do you catch that? Jesus identifies himself with the persecuted Christians. This is not some vague moral solidarity. It's a statement of profound truth that the church is the body of Christ such that her members are his members. So St. Paul got the message and taught in all his letters. He later wrote to the Corinthians saying, and I quote, for as the body is one and has many members, means limbs and so on, and all the members of the body, whereas they are many, are yet one body, so also is Christ. For in one spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether bond or free, and in one spirit we have all been made to drink. 
for the body also is not one member, but many, end quote. St. Augustine expressed all this in the following idea. Christ is the head of the church. The church is the body of Christ. The whole Christ is both the head and the body. So Tucker Carlson, Russell Brand, John Henry Weston, none of us can hope to stand in the evil day and persevere in the face of powerful spiritual evil or in the face of these superhuman assaults on civilization unless we stand clothed and robed in Christ himself, for which abiding in his one church is absolutely necessary. No genius that you have or Russell Brand had could get us there. Jesus expressed the idea of abiding in him very clearly during his time on earth. In some of his last words to his apostles before he died, he showed just how closely we are to associate ourselves with him. He said, and I quote, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abide in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he shall be cast out as a branch and shall wither, and they shall gather him up and cast him into the fire and burn. Did you catch that? We have to be associated with Jesus, just as a branch is to the vine, living the same life, being nourished with the same vine. Where and how can we be grafted onto him in that way so as to receive the divine sap of his life? Did you catch that? He said, we must abide in him. We all talk of God living within us, and that's right and proper, but we also have to live in him. And how do we do that? Well, most importantly, did you catch what he said? Without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Not just a little bit, or I can win a few victories, I can get a few things done. Nothing. Let's remember also the other side of this coin, as St. Paul said, I can do all things in him who strengthens me, from Philippians 4. How do we think that we're going to even enter a spiritual battle, let alone win one, without Christ? Not only that, he said that if we do not abide in him, that we are like broken branches that wither away and will be burnt up in fire. Outside of this church, we are outside of Christ. And outside of this church and Christ, the various spiritual arms and weapons are blunt and ineffectual. This is why the Council of Florence taught, and I quote, only to those remaining in the church, and that's uh, only to those remaining in her, but they're referencing the church, are the sacraments of the church of benefit for salvation and to do fastings, almsgiving, and other functions of piety and exercises of Christian service produce eternal reward. And that no one, whatever almsgiving he has practiced, even if he has shed blood for the name of Christ, can be saved unless he has remained in the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. End quote. This is why it's so important for anyone and everyone who recognizes what is happening in our world to enter and remain with that one church which Christ founded, against which the proud gates of hell cannot and will not prevail. There are many people in history who've come to realize that God exists and that Christianity is true, not because of or arguments or goodness, but because of seeing the evil that's in this world. Tucker. You have been blessed by God to see the nature of the conflict in which we find ourselves, and you are being blessed again now, even if by an unworthy messenger like myself, to be called to enter the Catholic Church. And I'm sure many of your friends have got to you before and told you this. You need to join the winning side. It's in the Catholic Church that the old, flawed self will be washed away and elevated to the supernatural order in baptism, in which you will be made into a soldier of Christ. 
in the true Catholic sacrament of confirmation in which you will be picked up and strengthened each time you fall and in which you will be fed and nourished by Christ's body in the Holy Eucharist. By this Holy Eucharist, you will be made more and more a part of that body, more and more able to stand in that evil day as a member of the whole Christ, clad in the virtue and power of Jesus himself. And in this way, and only in this way, will you be able to fight in this spiritual war, to fight and win. As St. Peter says in the Bible, outside of Noah's Ark, all were lost in the flood. But today, in the New Covenant, the Ark is not only open to Noah and his family and a few of each animal. So to you, Tucker, and all others standing outside the Roman Catholic Church, wondering what to do about the rain, we say, come in. Come in. Come into the only place that will prepare you for the spiritual battles that you're saying that you want to fight. For LifeSite News, this is John Henry Weston. And may God bless you.